Uh, hello, everybody. So what we're going to be looking at today is uh, section 4.2 in your book, which is uh, limits and continuity. So um, in order to do this, or rather, before we get started here, let's just talk about what we're going to learn how to do. Um, so what we're going to learn to do in this section is we're going to uh, calculate limits of functions of two variables. That's going to be one of our, our really one of the main topics here. Um, we're going to learn how to figure out that uh, a function does not have a limit if it has different limits along different paths. So I'll say, um, let's see, learn how uh, functions may have different limits along different paths. Of course, that doesn't mean anything to you now, but uh, that's what we're going to learn. Very useful. Um, what that's used for is um, when a function doesn't have a limit. Uh, this is one of our main ways of showing that a function does not have a limit. Um, we're going to learn what the conditions are for continuity. Uh, spoiler. They're exactly the same as for calculus one, right? Uh, if the limit equals the function value, it's continuous. So conditions for continuity. Uh, we're going to uh, verify continuity of a function. And then we're going to briefly consider functions with three variables. Nothing will be different for functions of three variables, which is why it just gets lumped in at the end. But uh, still, we should mention it. Not every function has two variables. Um, OK, so that's what we're going to be doing in this lecture. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So. Um, before we really get into new stuff, I want to remind you of what the defi definition of a limit is uh, from Calculus 1. So um, recall uh, the limit definition from Calculus 1. Now, depending on your Calculus 1 class, you may not have gone into detail on this. But uh, we, you should understand it a little bit at least so you can see how this is the same. So recall the limit definition from calculus one, something like this. We would say, um, we say that uh, the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l uh, if, and so here's our definition uh, for every, um epsilon greater than zero there is a delta greater than zero that's delta um such that if x minus a is less than delta then f of x minus l is less than epsilon now that's the definition and it's not that useful for calculating stuff it's really tedious to use for calculating stuff and then so um, nobody does so um, you know we use other methods to actually calculate limits but this is the where it comes from now kind of what I want to focus on is just the last bit here um, so what we're saying with this highlighted part here which is, I guess, actually the whole definition, is um, what we're using this epsilon greater than zero and delta greater than zero for are distances, okay? So when we say x minus a is less than delta, all we're really saying is that when x is really close to a, like presumably delta is a very small number and epsilon is also a very small number. So what we're saying here is that x and a are very close together. 
So this isn't like mathematically rigorous, but um, what we're saying is if X is very close to A, then F of X is very close to L. Right? And so what that looks like on the graph is you've got A somewhere. Now you don't have to have the point there. Um, so I like put an empty circle there. You don't have to have an empty circle there, of course. But um, this is what we're saying. Um, oh, also, I, I should have one more thing here. Sorry. Oops. Yeah, that's fine, actually. This should also be greater than zero. And the reason it needs to be greater than zero is what we're trying to say is that um, if x is close to a, so a is right here. So if you go put a little interval around a and have like this a plus delta, and this is a minus delta, then you can kind of come up here on the graph and you get this point, and you can come up here on the graph and you get this point. And then if you bring those over to the y-axis, you get something like this. And um, so the idea is that if this gets narrow, then this also gets narrow. And the reason we say that the distance from x to a is less than delta, but also the distance from x to a should be greater than zero is because if we allowed it to be zero, then this point would matter. The fact that it's up here and not down here. We can safely ignore this because um, the distance from A to A is zero. So this point is not included in this, which means that it doesn't matter in terms of whether or not the limit exists. So that's specifically to exclude stuff like this from ruining the limit, basically. So the idea is, um, on the x-axis, you are um, close to A, and then on the y-axis, you're also close to L. So L would be right here. And so you, for the L, actually, you can write like um, this is L, and then like L plus epsilon might be up here, and then L minus epsilon might be down there. And so what they're saying is uh, for any epsilon, um, you can find a delta so that um, this interval, the pink interval here, stays inside the green interval here. And that's the definition of continuity. But um, what you want to really understand here is that really when we're writing something like this, we're just trying to say this. If x is very close to a, then f of x is very close to l. Okay? And that's what you want to understand because we are moving into three dimensions or functions of two variables anyway. And um, we need a new definition of X is very close to L or X is very close to A. That's what we're, we're, we're doing, right? Um, so in Calc 1, the way we say um, distance from x to a is less than um, delta, for example, is like this, absolute value x minus a less than delta. Okay, um, how do we extend that to three dimensions? Okay, and here's how. Or I keep saying three dimensions, but we're only going to add two at first, right? We're only going to go x and y. So if I keep saying three dimensions, ignore me. Functions of two variables is what I mean. So in Calc 1, we have this. Um, for functions of two variables, we need a better definition. So how do we do the same thing? And so um, basically what we do is this. So uh, if you're on an x, y plane, so you have x and you have y, and then you have a point, instead of a, let's call it like a, b. 
Like, what does it mean to be close to AB, right? If you're trying to be close to AB, of course, that means you have to be close like that, right? But you don't have to be just close left and right. You also have to be close up and down. So in here. Also, um, you know, you don't want to be over here. That's not close. So you want to actually do this, right? If you put a circle around AB and you say you're inside that circle, then you're close to AB, right? So um, that's the idea. So inside the circle is close. We actually call that like inside the disk instead of circle. Um, the difference is that the circle is technically just the border and the disk is this whole thing inside. So uh, inside the disk is close to AB. That's how you do it. And so um, once we have that idea that that's what it means to be close instead of like something like this on a, on a number line, um, we can write out that definition. So we say, um, I guess actually they just define what it means to be a disk. So they say, um, consider a point uh, AB, okay, in R2. Yep, we did that. Um, here's their definition, a delta disk, which by the way, I don't think I've ever heard anybody call it a delta disk before. That's kind of a weird thing, but a delta disk centered at AB uh, is defined to be the open disk with radius delta. I'm going to explain open in a second. Um, centered at AB. I don't know why they keep saying centered at AB. Here it is. So it's the set of all X and Y that exist in R2 such that the absolute value, um, actually, let's just get rid of that absolute value. I'm going to use a different definition here. Um, X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared is less than delta. Okay. That's actually slightly different than what they, the book uses. They have no square root and this is squared. Um, but it's actually exactly what we drew here. Um, the only thing is um, the word open. So actually, when we want the open disk, what we do is we're saying make this like dash so it's not included. And then we want the inside. And the inside is the open disk. So the open disk does not include the border. Okay. Okay, um, and we, boundary is probably the better way to say that. I'm going to say border slash boundary. Okay, um, so there you go. That's your definition of an open disk, and it's just a circle around the point. Okay, um, now why do we care? Well, we can basically... Um, We can basically replace this kind of thing here, x minus a less than delta, with this kind of thing here, this right here, right? So this is how you would do it for just, um, oops, this is how you say x is close to a. Here's how you would say x, y is close to a, b. Okay, so um, let me just write that before we move on. So in Calc 1, uh, x close to a is x minus a less than delta. Um, in Calc 3, x, y close to a, b is x minus a squared 
plus y minus b squared less than delta. So it's the exact same idea here, right? In fact, if you just cross this off, then this would just be square root x minus a squared, which is the absolute value of x minus a. So actually this one is this one if you just remove this term. Okay, um, and that's really what we were trying to do here. And this right here, when you see it, what you're saying is that x comma y is inside this little circle. It's inside a little circle around AB. The radius of the circle is the delta. All right, um, having done that, we can now have a definition of a limit. So it's gonna look a lot like our other definition of a limit, but now it's a function of two variables. Um, so let f be a function of two variables. of x and y, uh, the limit of f of xy as xy approaches a b uh, is L written so the notation is pretty much the same as limits that you've done before. Limit x, y approaches a, b. You just have to put the x and the y in your limit of f of x, y equals L. And this is if uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, there is, um, a delta greater than zero uh, such that if zero less than square root x minus a squared plus y minus b squared less than delta, then absolute value f of xy minus L less than epsilon. So the only thing that changed is this right here, right? So this is the same definition that we had for the definition of the limit uh, up here. Where is it? Here it is. Here it is. Where is it here? Right? So you had this and basically that got changed to account for the fact that now instead of X close to a, we have X, Y close to a B. Um, this right here didn't change because here, this is a number and this is a number, right? And we, so we use absolute values to indicate things are close to each other. Um, whereas down here, f of x, y is still a single number. So this is not like a vector, right? It's a single number. This is a single number. So this kind of thing is not appropriate. We just want absolute values like we did before, right? The x and the y's are two variables at once, right? But the out output of the function is just a number like it always was. Um, okay, so that's what it means to have a limit. Um, now, what can we do with it? I guess um, we can have a, let's just uh, look at a little picture here to give us an idea. The equivalent of, we wanna look at the equivalent of this picture right here. Okay. So the equivalent would be this. I should have just used the one in the book. The one in the book is actually really good, but instead you get my hand drawn nonsense. Okay. So what this is, is this is a surface. So this is going to be like Z equals of X, Y. Okay. Now we know that, um, if we want to look at uh, limit x, y approaches a, b of f of x, y equals L, then what you do is you say, okay, well, a, b is somewhere down here on this plane, right? It's in the x, y plane. And we know that what we're talking about is that um, the distance from x, y to a, b needs to be less than delta. We know that that looks like 
this inside of a disk. So if you make a little circle around that point there and you're in there, that's what it means for this right here. Now, if you come up on straight up here, you're going to run into this uh, surface eventually. And so you don't know what that shape's gonna look like. Maybe it looks like a little bean there, right? It depends on the shape of the surface. Um, but um, you get section up here. And there's an L there. I should do that in color. Um, there's an L there. And you've got your like L plus epsilon there, and you got your L minus epsilon there. And delta is that distance. So if you're inside this circle with radius delta, you come up here, you're on this little bit of the surface, and you can see that on the z axis, you're in between L plus epsilon to L minus epsilon. And as this gets smaller and smaller, this shape up here would get smaller and smaller and presumably would just be exactly at L. Okay, um, so that's what's going on. That's how it's the same and how it's different than um, a limit in calculus one. So when this circle shrinks, this little bit shrinks too, and it ends up at a Z value of L. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, having done that, then you have a bunch of limit laws. So these are going to be um, the exact same limit laws that you have from calculus one written in terms of the new types of functions, right? So limit laws. These are going to be same as calc one, right? Um, so here they are. Ooh, let me find our stuff. So uh, f of x, y, and g of x, y, of course, are just going to be um, functions, okay? Um, and they have limits. So the limit as x, y approaches a b of the f of x, y, that limit is we're going to call L. And the limit as X, Y approaches A, B of the G of X, Y, that's just a different limit. Let's just call it M. Okay. Um, and then we're going to have C is just going to be a constant. Okay. Now let's do our laws. So if you do a limit as x, y approaches a, b of c, you just get c, right? Limit of a constant is a constant, exactly like calculus one. Um, if you do a limit as x, y approaches a, b of just x, what do you think you do? Well, x is approaching a, right? So the limit of X should just be A. And if you do the limit of X, Y, which is A, B of Y, that's just going to be B, right? You just plug in the Y is approaching B, so Y is approaching B. And another law. So if you do the limit as X, Y approaches A, be getting really tired of writing that. You know what? Genius. Copy. Okay, let's continue on. If you do the limit of f of x, y plus g of x, y, then that's the same thing as how do I do it? Paste. Then the limit of x, y of f of x, y plus limit of x, y of g of x, y. 
So basically, if you have the limit of two functions added, you split it up into two limits. And of course, you know the limit of the first function is L, and you know the limit of the second function is M, and you know that because we just set it up here. Okay, so that's just the sum law, just like you would have from calculus one. Um, the You have the... Uh, difference law. So if you change this to a minus sign, minus, 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 of course. Uh, so there's your difference law, uh, constant multiple law. If you use limit of x, y approaches a, b, of a constant times f of x, y. That's just going to be c times the limit of f of x, y, which is l, right? Um, products, um, if you have the limit if you have the limit of x, y approaches a, b of two functions multiplied together. These aren't derivatives, so you don't have to do like the derivative product rule, right? Um, if you do this limit, then that's the same thing as doing the limit of f and then the limit of g and the limit of f is l and the limit of v is m. Okay, uh, what else? Okay, three more, three more, it takes forever to do these. Um, if you have the limit as x, y approaches a, b of f of x, y over g of x, y, um, then I'm not gonna write out this middle step here, um, the limit of f is l and the limit of g is m and that would be true as long as there's not a divide by zero so this this is true if uh, m is not zero right no divide by zero allowed of course uh, power rule or power law if you do the limit of a function to a power then you can actually um, do the limit of the function, which is L, and then just raise it to the power. And um, you could do the same thing with roots, but it's actually the same rule. Oh, this is for any positive integer n. So they didn't allow fractions here, but I will now. So if you do the nth root, then you can actually do the limit first and then the root. Um, okay, I think that's it. So I think we're done and that's gonna be, oh, okay. Let's see what they say. They say for all L, this is for all L, Um, this is going to be if, uh, so this is going to be if L is positive and N is even, right? Because you can't always, you can't do a square root of a negative number, for example. You also can't do a fourth root, sixth root, eighth root of a negative number. Uh, you can only do odd roots of negatives. So if L is positive and N is even, uh, or if um, n is odd. Okay. All right. So um, those are your rules, lots of rules. I'm not going to prove these. Um, it always boils down to 
actually these don't boil down to the same definitions from calculus one you would have to um do the proofs using the new definition of a limit that we have here um which just like we don't use the definition very much in calculus one we're not going to use this definition in calculus three okay um, i'm not going to make i'm not going to prove these uh, if you want to if you want proofs uh take real analysis so take you know transfer to another school and take real analysis and you'll do a lot of these proofs um, also if you take complex analysis you'll do a lot of these proofs but they'll be a little bit harder in complex analysis because you're allowing like imaginary numbers as well um okay so we're not going to do these proofs um let's do something here so let's try this uh, evaluate the limit of x y approaches 2 comma negative 1 of uh, x squared uh, minus 2xy plus 3y squared minus 4x what the plus 3y minus 6 too long um but that's the that's the example here um so let's just notice a couple things so first of all um for stuff like this here and this here and this here and this here right you would apply that first rule sorry this fifth rule um would tell you how to handle those leading coefficients right so rule five deals with those these um then for the individual um x's and y's like that one and that one you would just need um this rule too right rule two for x and y um then you've got a couple of other rules, like for example, this x squared, you would need like this power rule, right? Combined with, you need this rule for how to deal with the exponent along with rule two, which tells you how to take the limit of x. Um, so for this right here, you need rule uh, two and eight, I think. Um, and then you've got, like a, a y squared and an xy, which like for the xy, you would be using um, this rule, rule six, which tells you how to do functions multiplied together, along with uh, rule two, which was the one for x's and y's. Okay, so I mean, enough of that. What I'm really saying here is that as long as you're dealing with like these powers of x and y, you just plug in these numbers. That's that's the real punchline here. Okay, and the rules will allow you to do that. Um, so basically, uh, will allow you to just plug in um two comma negative one for you know any kind of powers of x and y All right that's really what it comes down to so um when i'm doing that let's fit this on the screen uh we can say this limit is going to be equal to and just do what i said plug in the x and the y so like x squared is going to be two squared uh, minus 2xy is going to be 2, 2, negative 1, plus 3y squared, y is negative 1 squared, minus 4x, x is 2, plus 3y, y is negative 1, minus 6. And you just, you know, work that out. 4 uh, plus 4, yeah, plus 3, minus 8 minus three minus six okay what do we get so we have eight eleven three zero negative six the negative six 
I'll just check that to see if I wrote it right. Um, I didn't. Oh, no, it is. OK, that's right. OK, so um, I didn't actually do this line by line where I used all those rules. But um, I mean, I think that makes sense, right? Like you would be able to evaluate this limit by using the rule for um, this kind of thing to split it up into the limit of x, limit of y. And then for the limit of x and for the limit of y, you're going to use these rules to do those individually and so on. OK, so for powers of x and y, you just plug in the numbers. OK, so all right, um, also for roots and stuff as well. So like we do one more like uh, example. Limit x, y approaches. 5 minus 2 of, we got a cube root of x squared minus y, where y squared plus x minus 1. Um, so basically, we can just plug in the numbers again as long as we don't get any divide by zeros or anything weird. So um, uh, there are rules for roots and for fractions. Um, and exponents, right? That's what I see here. And sums, uh, etc. What's that mean? Just plug it in. Five minus two. Okay, you could work it out more carefully, but you know you're not going to. Nobody is. Cube root and plug in your numbers. So five squared minus minus 2 over minus 2 squared plus 5 minus 1. So you're going to end up with simply the cube root of, what do we got? 25 plus 2, so 27, over 4 plus 5, which is 9, minus 1, which is 8. So you have the cube root of 27 over 8. Cube root of 27 is 3. Cube root of 8 is 2. OK, so 3 halves. So that's not um, not too bad. And uh, now let's talk about uh, limits that fail to exist. OK. So let's see. So uh, imagine a point uh, x, y approaching a point a, b. There are many ways it could do that. There are many paths on which it could approach. Say many, I actually mean infinitely many. So for example, if you've got um, a, a, b right there, and you can have x, y, over here, and it can just go straight like that, right? But it doesn't have to. Um, you could have a, b over, uh, sorry, you could have a, b here, and you could have x, y above it, and then it could approach a, b. Uh, or you could have a completely different kind of thing going on. You can approach a, b along a diagonal line. Or you could approach a, b along a line like this.
or you could approach a B along a line like this, right? There's just an infinite number of ways to do that. And so a key fact about these limits is uh, if, so this is a, a fact that we need to know, um, if the limit as x, y approaches a, b of f of x, y equals l. So if the limit exists, then uh, you must get the same answer along every single path. Uh, approaching on every possible path. Okay, so no matter how you do it, you would get the same answer L. Now, the reason we care about that is because this means that if you don't get the same answer along different paths, then the limit doesn't exist. So uh, let's call this fact one. Fact two. Um, if you um, approach, if x, y, Um, how do I want to say this? Not if you, if X, Y, um, nope. If you find two paths on which you get different limits, then you know for sure that the limit doesn't exist. Does not exist. Okay. And that's actually our, um, our, easiest way of finding out that a limit doesn't exist, okay, um, is by approaching along paths. Um, so our strategy is this. Strategy. Uh, if you think a limit does not exist, Uh, try to find two paths on which you get different limits. Now, we haven't done that yet, so I understand that you don't know how to do that. Uh, if you do, if you do find two paths that give different limits, then the limit does not exist. Okay, um, so that's our strategy to show that limits don't exist. Now, in order to, you know, to do this, we need to know how to show that a limit approaches something along a particular path. So here's how you would do that. Um, so it's just going to be a, a little bit of practice. Um, so let's see. How would I do it? What do I want to call this? It's not really example. Well, I'll call it an example anyway. Um, evaluate, let's say, limit as x, y approaches, um, let's just say 0, 0. Uh, I just need a function here. It can be any kind of function. Uh, I'm going to say uh, 2xy over. Um, x squared plus y squared. Uh, I'm going to say evaluate that limit along the path um, just y equals 0. 
Okay, so I'm just trying to explain how to do this at this point. So the point is this. So you've got this point zero, zero here, right? And you can approach this point from any kind of way in principle, right? But I'm specifically telling you along the path y equals zero. Now the path y, like y equals zero is a horizontal line, right? That's y equals zero. And so you're going to be following this. You have to approach horizontally. Now, how would you do that though? How do you approach um, along this path y equals zero? What you do is you plug in y equals zero in here, and then also you replace it here. So um, you, you do the following, right? So um, you replace uh, y equals zero in 2xy over x squared plus y squared, and then do uh, the limit. Then you would just do a limit as x approaches zero um, instead of limit x y approaches zero zero because there are no y's anymore once you make that substitution okay so that's all you have to do to approach along a path it seems harder than it is uh, honestly and you'll see right now when we actually do it like i'm spending too much time not doing it instead of doing it right so let's do what I said. So you, first of all, uh, replace y with 0, right? Because we're doing the path y equals 0. Um, so what do we get? Uh, well, the fraction's going to turn into 2 times x times 0 over x squared plus 0 squared. And you see that there's no y's in there at all. So your limit, instead of being x, y approaches 0, 0, is now x approaches 0, which is the limit as x approaches 0 of, what is it? Well, in the numerator, if you do 2 times x times 0, you have 0 over x squared. And then you just evaluate that. using what you know from calculus one. So from calculus one, you would know that the first thing you should do is just work out this fraction here, zero over x squared, which is the limit as x approaches zero of zero. And then of course, that's just zero. So you get zero, okay? So that's how you approach along a path like this. Now, what are we gonna do next? Let's do another example. We're gonna approach along a different path. So we're, I'm going to say, let me just actually copy the same exact problem. I'm going to change the path. Duplicate. Evaluate this limit along the path. Y equals, I'm just putting something here just to show you, 3X. Okay. So completely different path now, right? So that would look like this. You've got zero, zero here, right, on the xy plane. And now the line y equals 3x is a straight line like this, right? But it's a slanted line. That's different than what we did before, right? So that's along the line y equals 3x. So that's the path we're approaching on. That's obviously different, a different path than this path where we approached horizontally. Now, is it going to give you a different answer? Well, we don't know. We have to try it, right? So we're going to try to approach along this path. The strat or like the steps are the same, right? We're going to substitute um, y equals 3x, and then we're going to the limit will not have any y is left, and we will um, evaluate the limit. The, the limit as x approaches zero again for the exact same reason as before, because there won't be any y is left to worry about. So let's do this. So what do you do? 
you replace all of the y's with 3x, because that's our path. So our fraction becomes 2 times x times y, but y is 3x over x squared plus y squared, oops, y is 3x squared, and that's a limit as x approaches 0 now. We don't need to do y approaches 0 because there's no y's, right? There's no y's here. And that's why you can fall back on your calculus 1 uh, work or what you know about calculus 1 limits in order to evaluate this one because it's a single variable. All right, so let's do this. We got a limit as x approaches 0. Um, in the numerator, we have 6x squared. And in the denominator, we've got x squared plus 9x squared. So what we've got is a limit as x approaches 0. In the numerator, 6x squared. In the denominator, x squared plus 9x squared, which is 10x squared. So then we're just going to work this out. So uh, we can divide those fractions. First of all, 6 over 10 is 3 over 5. And then also, x squared over x squared just cancels, right? So it's actually just the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 fifths. Well, look at that. We got, a, we got an answer there. That one's not 0. It's 3 fifths. Now, if you look at this, we actually did. It was the same function that we were working out on both of these examples, right? So we, we evaluated the limit on a certain path and got 0. We changed the path to y equals 3x, and now we get a limit of 3 fifths. So along those two different paths, we end up with two different limits. So um, if I ask you this, I could say explain why uh, the limit as x, y approaches 0, 0 of, let me copy it. Could have just copied the whole thing, actually. Oops. Duplicate, down here, that out of the way, didn't bring out everything. Okay, so explain why that limit doesn't exist. All right, so we saw that along the path, y equals 0, the limit is 0. And we also saw along the path y equals, oh, is it 3x? The limit is 3 fifths. The limit can't be 0 and 3 fifths. So that tells us that the limit does not exist at all. Uh, so since we found two, we found different limits along different paths, that means the limit does not exist. Okay, now before we go any further, I want to just give you a big warning here. Um, um, if you try two paths and get the same limit, that doesn't prove that the limit exists because how do you know that the two paths that you tried are like the only two that give like how like the two that you tried and got the same answer um aren't all of the possible paths right there's infinitely many paths so showing two of them give you the same answer doesn't do anything right so if you try to get two paths and get the same limit that does not prove 
that the limit exists. Right? The next path you try might give you a different limit. So uh, could still give you a different limit, which would mean that the limit doesn't exist. All right. Um, now, what kind of paths should you try if you're going to try to do this? Um, if you try this, uh, some good paths to try are the following. Right, uh, x equals zero is a good path. Uh, y equals zero is a good path. Um, y equals x is a good path. Actually, y equals mx in general is a good path. You can even use the, the m. You don't even have to put in a number there. Like when we did 3x, I could have just done mx. Would have been fine. Um, after you try that, maybe you want to try like a second power, right? Um, you usually don't go higher. Usually, you know, you wouldn't go higher, um, but you always could. Um, I don't know, I'll use K, I guess, um, you know, et cetera. So these are the kinds of paths that you might try. Uh, now, again, the reason you have to know a few of them is because just because you try two of them doesn't mean anything. But usually, if the limit is going to not exist, usually if you try like, um, something that's X and something that's X squared, usually you'll get different limits, uh, if that strategy is going to work. Okay. So, um, what I do want to do is I want to show you, uh, what it looks like when a limit doesn't exist. Um, um of F of X, Y looks like. Uh, when a limit doesn't exist. And I'm going to get that picture from the book. So let's go over here. Um, let's go. What are we doing? Oh, the book. Calculus 3, Volume 3. limits and continuity. Where is it? Solutions. Probably in here. Okay. Yeah. So this is what it looks like when limits don't exist. So add to photos. Well, failed. Oh, no, it's right there. Oh, it was right there. Okay. So this is what happens. This isn't the exact function that we did because I didn't put a three there. Um, but uh, this is the kind of thing that happens. So you can see that, like, if you come along like this kind of path, you end up right here in the graph, right? But if you approach along another path, like down here, you end up down here. So obviously different paths are giving you different answers, right? So like this one and this one don't end up in the same place. So those are different paths that give you different limits. And so you just kind of have like something weird going on at this point here that causes that to happen. Okay. And it's really this divide by zero that is the main issue. But just because there's a divide by zero doesn't mean that there is an issue. Um, what, what tends to happen, and you know, by tends to, I mean, probably always, is that um, the top is second degree and the bottom is second degree. Um, 
usually you'll have different limits along different paths if the degrees match. Um, if the top is higher degree, then um, usually the limit as you approach zero, zero uh, will exist. But um, you wouldn't be able to prove it with this technique because this is not a technique that proves it. Um, okay. Let's do one more of these and um, and then we'll be done with this because it's the same thing every time. Uh, example, uh, let's uh, show the limit as x, y approaches, we're gonna go zero, zero again, of four x, y squared uh, over x squared plus three y to the fourth does not exist. Now we can try any paths that we want, remember, um, but I suggested something like this, where you try like, first you try like first degree and then you try like second degree and maybe put a constant on there. So we'll try a couple paths. So let's uh, try, try a few paths and see what happens. Uh, let's try uh, y equals mx. Okay, so if you're trying to approach along y equals mx, uh, you substitute the mx in here for y, you get 4xmx squared, right? Putting that in for y. In the denominator, you have x squared plus 3mx to the fourth. And we're doing a limit now just as x goes to zero because there are no y's. Okay, so just like we did a couple times, you're going to work that out in the numerator and the denominator. Um, be careful with your exponents here. You have 4x and then mx squared is m squared x squared. People forget to square the m. Down here we have x squared plus 3 and we have mx to the fourth. That's going to be m to the fourth x to the fourth. Okay, so we'll try to simplify this as much as we can here. We've got uh, in the numerator, we have four m squared x to the three. At the denominator, we've got x to the two plus three m to the fourth x to the fourth. Okay, so um, we try this. Um, Everything has at least two x's, so let's just cancel two x's on everything. So we're going to have the limit as x goes to zero. Everything goes down by two. So we have four m squared x. Then we have one plus three m to the fourth x squared, like that. And um, I think we can just plug in x equals zero now, right? Um, so the powers on x is all went down by two because I canceled two of them everywhere. Um, now let x go to zero. So you end up with four m squared zero, one plus three m to the fourth, zero squared. So that's zero over one plus zero, which is zero. So that's what we get along one particular path. Now, that doesn't tell you anything, right? That just, that was the limit along one path. So you try another path. Uh, what other path might we try? Well, we tried, we tried this one and we got a number. Let's try this one and see what happens. Um, you know, also you don't have to use like M and K, like why are we using K here? Why are we using M here? Uh, no reason, right? They're just, um, constants uh, that we haven't decided on yet. All right, so let's try another path. Let's try path um, y equals kx squared. And let me just copy this again. Nope, not what we want. Let's copy this again. All right, so let's try it. So we are going to plug in kx squared. So we have a fraction, 4x kx squared squared. 
and the denominator x squared plus 3kx squared to the fourth, and then we have a limit as x goes to zero. Alrighty, work this out. So in the numerator, you have 4x, uh, k, what? Back. 4x k squared x to the fourth and the denominator x squared plus 3 kx squared to the fourth will be a to the fourth x x to the 2 to the fourth is going to be x to the eighth um all right So you work this out, you have 4k squared x to the fifth, and then in the denominator, you've got x to the 2 plus 3k or x to the 8. Um, I can cancel um, two x's everywhere again, and I get a limit as x goes to 0 of uh, 4k squared x to the 3 over one plus three k to the four x to the six. Put in your zero and you're gonna get zero over one plus zero again. I'm not gonna work it out and you get zero. So seemingly we haven't done anything, right? Because um, we got a zero and we got another zero. Um, so we didn't make it. We didn't do what we wanted to do. That doesn't mean you're done, right? Just because you did two paths and you got zero and zero, that just means you didn't do the right paths probably because you know, I told you that we are supposed to get that this does not exist. So try another path. So maybe try instead of we tried y equals kx squared, right? How about we try x equals ky squared? That'd be new, right? Or maybe we don't even need the k. Maybe we'll just try that. You can put the k in there if you want, but maybe we'll try this one x equals y squared. So we're going to do the same work that we just did again, but this time we are changing the uh, the path. All right. So if we try this, we're going to put x equals y squared in there. This time we have 4x, which is y squared, y squared. In the denominator, we have x squared, which is y squared squared, plus 3y to the fourth. And then now... This time, it's a little bit different than before. We're doing a limit as y goes to zero, right? Because everything's y, it's mm -hmm. x's. So let's work that out. In the numerator, you have 4y to the fourth. In the denominator, you have y to the fourth plus 3y to the fourth. Um, notice how this is a little bit different than before. Everything came up the same power. Convenient. Um, so you have uh, 4y to the 4th over 4y to the 4th, which is actually 1. So you have to limit as y approaches one, uh, 0 of 1, which is 1. So we actually do get a different path. We do get a different limit in our third path here, right? The previous one was 0, and this one is 1. So it took us three tries instead of two tries, but we did find two different paths that have different limits. So since uh, we found um, that the paths, uh, let's say what's the first, like the paths y equals kx squared and x equals y squared. Did we do kx squared? Yeah, we did. Uh, and x equals y squared uh, give different limits. So there is no limit. So it must not exist. Now, again, you, you might still be confused about like, whoa, why'd you put a constant there, but not there? I don't know. Just wanted to, right? There is no reason for it, really. Just wanted to make sure you understood that you could put like a constant like this there. Um, and that can sometimes help you figure out that different paths give different limits. Um, OK. So that is that.
Um, do we need these? Yeah, okay, I guess we do here. Um, so they give you definitions of open and closed in here. So I guess I will write these down. Um, so let's see here. Um, definitions. So uh, let S be a subset of R2. Now, remember, R2 is the XY plane. Okay, so what's this look like, by the way? I'm going to leave some space for the definition, but then I'm going to draw a picture. So, like, you got the XY plane, and you got some S. There it is, S. Okay, um, now, what we're going to do with this is we are going to say uh, a point P0 is an interior point. of S uh, if there is a uh, delta disk uh, centered at P0 uh, completely inside of S. Okay, now what's that mean? Well, if you take a point somewhere in S, like this one, right? That could be your P. Um, then you can draw, like you can draw a circle around it, right? And that circle is still in S. So circle is inside of S. That means that P is an interior point, okay? Now, how would that not happen? Well, if you take a point that's right on the border, like if you take a point like this that's right on the border, then there's no way to, to draw a circle that's inside of S, right? Any circle you draw around this point is going to be outside of S. So uh, circle, no circle um, around I'll call this point Q. No circle around Q is inside of S, right? It's always going to be outside partially. And so that's going to be a boundary point. It's what we're going to call it. Okay, um, so let's write the definition of boundary point. Um, so this was interior point, And then our other part of the definition is um, so a point in S, right? So that's the border counts as part of S here. Um, so a point in S um, is a boundary point if every um, delta disk containing uh, the point, I didn't give the point a name, um, point P0, again, we're going to use the same one, point P0 in S is a boundary point if every delta disk uh, containing uh, P0 uh, contains points uh, inside and outside of S. So what that's saying is, right, um, when you have something on the border, uh, some of the disk is going to contain stuff inside of S, and some of the disk is going to is going to be outside of S, and you always have that some inside, some outside, and um, that's what it means to be a boundary point.
Okay. So those are definitions for interior points and boundary points. And the reason um, you want one is because uh, we have definitions of open and closed here. So you know uh, in Calc 1, actually before calculus, in Calc 1 and before, Calc 2 and before actually, uh, we had open intervals and closed intervals, right? Like AB was open and AB like that was closed, right? Um, so we want the same thing for calculus three. So here's our definition. Um, let's see, S is a subset of R2. Um, S is open if every point in S is an interior point. And S is closed if um, all boundary points I didn't write points properly. Um, all boundary points of S are inside S. Okay, um, so what's the deal there? Um, so open sets are like this. Oops, that's just a jagged line. So an open set would be a set that does not, um, where the boundary is not included, is open. Um, if you do include the boundary that's closed, and if you have something where it's partially included, like this maybe, So not open or closed would be some of the boundary is included. Okay, so that's just the equivalent of open and closed intervals. Okay. Um, I don't really know why we are um, doing these, but um, I feel like this is not that interesting. Give me a second here. I'm just looking for boundary problems in the um, in the homework. I don't think there are any, to be honest. But I'm just going through it very quickly, and um, I will tell you if it's in there, and then we'll move on. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I'm not going to get that one right. Okay. Do we need it for continuity? I don't know. Let's see here. Oh, I mean, I, I think we don't even need it. I think this is just kind of wasted time, but okay. Um, let's just write their definitions and then we'll just get past their definitions. More definitions. Um, in open set S, in R2, 
uh, is connected is a connected set, I should say. Um, if it cannot be represented as the union of two or more disjoint non-empty open sets. Okay. Um, I guess that was part one. Part two of this is a set S is a region. Oh, this was just to get region. Oh, that's annoying. But uh, if it is open, connected, and non empty. Okay. So what are we saying here? So the reason they're doing this is because um, they want to be able to define, they want region to have a special meaning. Um, and so in order for region to have a special meaning, they needed to explain what connected was. In order to explain what connected was, it has to do with open sets. They had to explain what open and closed was. And it was just like, why are we even trying to do this. We just want to get to the definition of continuity. I don't care about regions, but they want to talk about continuity on a region. So that's, that's the nest. That's what they're doing. So, um, what is this then? So very simple idea, right? Oh, it's supposed to be S. This is going to be a connected, connected. S is connected. Let me just shade this. So if that's your S, then S is connected. If your S is in multiple pieces, it is not connected. So it's really, that's why they use the word connected. It's just very simple idea. If it's in pieces, it's not connected. And that's what they're talking about when they say, um, if it can't be represented as the union of two or more disjoint non-empty open subsets, right? So here, right, you've got each of these could be in its own subset. So that's what makes it not connected. Um, but you know, visually it's just this. Um, okay. So that's connected versus non-connected and also region just means open connected and non-empty, right? Means there's gotta be something in the set. Um, okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, they also do definitions of limits um, at boundary points. I guess we'll write it. Um, let f of x, y be a function of two variables. I'm just going to say be a function because it's obvious it has two variables. Um, let a, b just be a point on the boundary this time. on the boundary of the domain. Uh, then the limit as X, Y approaches a B of F of X, Y equals L. So this is just another definition of a limit, but this is specifically for boundary points. Um, so this would be, um, Hold on. It's the same stupid definition. What's the point? 
they didn't even change it. Hold on a second. Okay, well, whatever. I'm just going to write it and we will move on. I think, again, we're still wasting time. Um, okay. The limit is uh, for every if for all epsilon greater than zero, there is a delta greater than zero um, such that um, Oh yeah, for any x, y uh, inside the domain of L, or of F, sorry. Um, and within delta of a, b, there is in F of x, y, no more then epsilon away from L. It's just the same definition though. They say if um, zero less than X minus A squared plus Y minus B squared, it's this definition. Uh, less than delta implies f of x, y minus l, less than epsilon. Same definition. I don't know why they're doing that. The only thing is they've just added the word boundary points. Um, and the only thing that's new, maybe new, is that um, they say inside the domain of f. Um, and that's because of something like this. Um, so why are they doing that? So the point is, that for something like this, um, limit as x, y approaches four comma three of square root 25 minus x squared minus y squared. Um, if you have that kind of function, then um, on the x, y plane, I don't know why I'm drawing this all crooked, but I am. Um, on the x, y plane, um, this, the domain of the function here is going to be, it goes out to five, it goes down to negative five, it goes up to positive five, it goes down to negative five. That's the domain of this function. And the point four comma three is actually on it, on the border here. And the point is, is that um, you, when you're doing these limits, you only consider like the paths that stay inside of the domain because of the fact that any of the x, y's um, inside of the domain are the ones you care about, okay? Um, so the only new thing there is that, that idea, right? So, um, basically, uh, you don't worry about Uh, approaching for three, right? That's the, where we're going to, you don't worry about approaching for three, um, from X, Y outside of the domain. Anyway, um, but you would just evaluate this by plugging in the four and the three anyway, and like the limit's gonna be zero. But um, this is the point here. So anyway, anyway, um, the limit as x, y of four, three of square root 25 minus x squared. So y squared is simply just plug that in, uh, 25 minus four squared minus three squared, which is, zero. Um, I'm not going to prove 
that that limits zero with the epsilon delta definition. I'm just going to just state that, that we're only worrying about paths like the ones that I drew here that are starting inside of the domain, which is that circle there. Um, okay, anyway, uh, let's move on and do continuity, which is actually kind of pretty much our last topic here. And thankfully it is quick. Continuity. Um, so very simple, same definition as Calc 1. So we say, um, f of x, y is continuous at a, b, if, and there's three conditions for continuity. Um, first of all, you need the function value to exist. So you need to be able to plug in a, b. Uh, you need the limit as x, y approaches a, b to exist. And then those two things need to be equal. So f of a, b actually needs to be the limit as x, y approaches a, b of f of x, y, right? And that's exactly the same definition of continuity that you have in a calculus one uh, course. Um, so, I mean, there's not really, there's not really a lot to do. Um, so we can just, I'll just make like a note here. Example, uh, I'll just say explain. That's not what you have to do in the homework, right? But I'll just do it. Explain why, um, f of x, y equals three x plus two y over x plus one, x plus y plus one is continuous at, um, just a point, I'm just gonna say uh, two, two, that's not the point in the book, I'm just gonna use two, two. All right, so first of all, if you evaluate this, right, uh, f of two, two is gonna simply be plugging in two, two into the function. So three times two plus two times two over two plus two plus one. So you get six plus four over two plus two plus one, which is five, overall you get two. All right, so the function value exists. Now, then you need to evaluate the limit. Limit as x, y approaches a, b of 3x plus 2y over x plus y plus 1. Now, technically, the way you do this is by, um, you know, we said, uh, well, the rules would allow you just to plug in the a, um, the a, b, actually. The a and the b is 2, 2, so 2, 2. Um, we know that basically what you do is just plug in the numbers, but that's cheating because that's using the definition of continuity when you plug that in. So you can't just plug it in. Um, but basically if you apply all of your rules for limits, so use uh, limit laws that we talked about, then I know that the limit here uh, would be equal to um, the limit. I'm just gonna write lim instead of x, y approaches two, two. I hope you can understand why limit of the top over the limit of the bottom, right? That's a, that's a rule. And then we know that for sums, you can do the limit of the first one plus the limit of the second one. Here, you got the limit of the first one, the limit of the second one, and the limit of the one. Um, then you've got another rule that said for these um, scalar multiples here, or constant multiples, that you could uh, essentially take the three out, you could take the two out, right? So this is all just limit laws that we wrote down. And finally, um, you can actually just evaluate these limits because um, you just plug in at this point, you plug in the two, 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 because specifically you have a rule, however many pages ago, 
that says you can just oh so so far away you have you have a rule way up here that says that you can just plug in the numbers if it's just an x or just a y okay so um that's what's going on here so at this point the limit laws themselves say you can just plug it in so you just plug it in so 3 times 2 plus 2 times 2 over 2 plus 2 plus 1. And that's going to be the same as it was before. All right. And then um, you say, we got the same answer twice. Um, we see limit x, y uh, approaches to 2. Uh, f of x, y equals uh, two, but that's also what f of two, two was. So we're done. So f of x, y is continuous on, not on, at two, two. Okay. So um, you're not really going to be doing a lot where you prove continuity or anything because it does kind of boil down to Things like polynomials are continuous and so on. Um, all right, let's keep going on this extremely long lecture. Um, the continuity. Okay, what are we doing? Uh, properties of continuous functions. So if uh, f of x, y and g of x, y are both continuous at a, b, all right, um, then what we could have is that um, f of x, y uh, plus or minus g of x, y is also continuous at a, b. So you can add continuous functions to get continuous functions. Um, you can multiply continuous functions to get continuous functions. So f of x, y times g of x, y is continuous at a, b. Um, also, f of x, y over g of x, y is continuous as long as you're not dividing by zero. So this is going to be um, if g of a, b is not zero. Because if it's zero, you're dividing by zero. And of course, that's not good to be divided by zero. Um, doesn't exist. So, all right. Let's see here. This is just kind of annoying, but um, let's see here. Um, I don't want to write this theorem the way that they wrote it. I'm just going to write it the way that makes sense. Theorem. So um, let's see here. Consider this function. Okay, this is what we're going to consider. Um, we're going to consider the composition of functions. We're going to consider f of g of a, b uh, is continuous at a, b. Now, the question is, what do you need for that to happen? Okay, what is it need? Like, how would that happen, right? That's the conclusion. Um, f of g of a, b is continuous at a, b. So in order for this to happen, um, well, first thing that's going to happen is you're plugging a, b into g. So g would need to be continuous at a, b. So if uh, g of x, y is continuous, 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 continuous at a, b, right, then this is going to be fine. But then g of a, b is just a number, right? Um, so uh, 
Hold on a second here. Yeah, okay. So if g of xy is continuous at a, b, and then g of a, b is going to give you a number, right? So f needs to be continuous at that number. So g of a, b is just a number. Um, then this is going to be your conclusion. Okay. Um, they write it very differently than that. Um, but this is how I want to write it. And um, I think it makes sense the way I wrote it. So that's how I'm going to write it. Okay. Um, another thing I want to say is just a couple of um, kind of summary of some things. So common functions. Right. Um, just recall that uh, many functions are continuous in two dimensions, are in, in calculus one. Uh, polynomials, right, like x squared, but also now we got like x squared plus you know, y squared plus 3xy dot dot dot, stuff like that are always continuous. Um, also, sine and cosine are continuous functions. Um, so like if you do like sine x plus y, that's going to be continuous. Uh, if you do like cosine x, y, that's going to be continuous because like the x plus y, like x plus y is a polynomial, which is continuous. And then if you plug a continuous function into a continuous function, you get a continuous function by this theorem right here, right? So like f is the sine function. And then this is your function of two variables, um, the x and the y there. right, um, et cetera. Those are all going to be continuous. Um, also exponentials, right? Exponentials are continuous. So like e to the x plus y is continuous, uh, e to the 3x squared, y to the fifth is continuous, uh, et cetera. Um, so all the stuff that's continuous in calculus one is still continuous. In calculus three, because you're just going to be plugging continuous things like this, probably into your continuous functions. And this theorem about plugging a continuous function into a continuous function still being continuous um, is fine. Um, all right, here, so let me look at this. Um, yeah, I'm going to do this problem just because I just see it in the homework and it's kind of a pain. Um, so let's just do this as our last example for one hard homework question here. Um, they say, uh, determine the region, um, in the X, Y plane where, um, F of X, Y equals sine inverse x squared over 25 plus y squared is continuous. Now this looks a lot harder than it is, but you, I mean, you may not know how to do it before you, when you start. Okay. So, um, here's what you should think when you're trying to solve a problem like this. So here's the first thing I think, um, I should think uh, x squared over 25 plus y squared, that part is continuous. That's just a polynomial, right? So that's continuous uh, everywhere. Okay, 
Now the sine inverse is not continuous everywhere because it's not defined e uh, everywhere. So sine inverse of, you know, whatever, I'm just going to say sine inverse of x, y, t, I'm going to say theta. Uh, no, that's a bad variable, right? You put in, that's the least, I should not put that in. Okay, I'm just going to say sine inverse of question mark uh, is um, not even defined everywhere. Right? What are you allowed to plug into sine inverse, right? Um, so I, I noticed that. And then what I think is um, actually um, sine inverse, uh, I'll put an X there now, is only actually defined uh, when X is between negative one and one, right? Because you're going backwards from a sine to an angle and sine is only defined between, sine is only gives you results between negative one and one. So working backwards, you have to plug in stuff between negative one and one. So this is a little bit complicated, but that's the idea there. So it's only defined when the absolute value of X is in between negative one and one, uh, or you could say it this way, uh, when the absolute value of X is less than one, less than or equal to one, okay? Um, however you want to say it. Um, so what we need here is, uh, so for this, sine inverse uh, x squared over 25 plus y squared, um, that is going to need the inside here must have to be between negative one and one, right? In order for the sine function, sine inverse function to be defined. Uh, we need the inside here, the x squared over 25 plus the y squared, um, that needs to be between negative one and one. All right, now how are you, like, what are you gonna do with this, okay? Um, well, let's figure this out, right? So you have to go like, okay, well, what is this? So the question is, what does this look like? So what does x squared over 25 plus y squared um, less than or equal to one look like? Okay, and by the way, I'm just gonna notice here that um, I don't actually need this negative one because this is positive and this is positive, which means all of this is always positive. So I can kind of just throw away that negative one just because I noticed that this is always positive anyway. And actually you don't even need that, right? Because because it is always positive, all we need to worry about is it being less than one here. So what does that look like? And so um, you plot this. Plot x squared over 25 plus y squared uh, less than one. Actually, let's do this to start with. And you should recognize that as an ellipse. Right? And I'm not going to go over graphing an ellipse right now uh, because we are forever, we've been doing this forever already today. But um, you know, or you should know, that x squared over 25 indicates that the x, the limit, like the ellipse stretches to plus and minus 5 on the x axis because of that. 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Like that. And the fact that there's nothing under the y indicates that really there's a one under the y, which would be like a radius of one in the y direction. So like this. So that's this ellipse, like that. Okay. And then the last thing is to recognize that what we actually had was not the equals. Um, 
we had x squared over 25 plus y squared is less than or equal to one. So that's gonna be the exact same thing, right? The difference is that we should have the inside, the inside of that circle included. And so that's what we would need to plot um, on our graph when we're doing this as a homework assignment. So you have to uh, Why won't this work? Okay. And so uh, anyway, uh, I wanted to do that problem just to show you it's not that hard. Um, really, it looked really complicated, but what it boils down to is that you're just saying like, well, where is this even defined? Like this is a continuous function, but it's not defined everywhere. It's only defined when this is in between negative one and one, and then that just dictates what you have to do to eventually figure out that this region here is the region where um, this is defined. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, this is it's an hour and 51 minutes, very long lecture, but I think I covered everything you need. Now, one thing you'll notice is that I did not cover um, functions of three variables. And the reason I didn't is because, well, number one, we've been here forever, but uh, number two, uh, you don't need to, right? Um, everything we did here can be done for functions of three variables. All the rules are the same. It's just instead of writing x, y, you write x, y, z. Um, so everything's identical if you add the z. It's just more pain in the butt to actually do the problems because it's extra writing, 50% more writing. Um, anyway, so that's it for today. I will uh, see you guys later.